Hello everyone, my name is Anzu Science, and uh, I just remembered my YouTube password. Yeah, we're going to be talking about recurrent neural networks today. Hello everyone, again. Welcome to the recurrent neural network. Uh, don't worry, if this looks weird, it's because it does. I'm going to go through what, what, what the heck you're looking at. So, you'll notice that this is sort of like lopsided compared to other neural network models that I've showed you in the past, where usually the input will be over here. Oh, crap. Like, you'll have an, a couple of input neurons, and then some hidden layer, and then a hidden layer, and then some outputs, and then all connected by, like, little lines. You guys know what I'm talking about. Well, this one is sort of rotated only for the sense of, like, um, show, showability here. So this is the input. This is where you put your, your input vector. And here's the thinking area. And here's your output. Very, very, very similar. But uh, what is this H of T thing? Like, what the heck is that? Well, that's what's special about neural networks. I hit recurrent neural networks. You'll notice there's, like, three of them. Like, why is there three? When, with that, when I showed you down there, there was just one total. But these are, these, oh, I should clarify. These are each individual networks that are only related to each other in the area of H of T. Because, you know, if they were one network, it would look more like, more like this. Obviously not. So this represents a many-to-many -many, uh, recurrent model because there's many inputs to many outputs. This is like if you were trying to do machine translation. Let's just say inputs here is a vectorized version of English, and output is the model trying to identify a vectorized version of German. So that would be a many-to-many -many German classifi classification. But uh, that's that's great and all, but why 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 H of T? What is H of T? What is all this? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Go away. So. Recurrent neural networks are special because when we try to apply regular networks to text, we kind of messed up. Because how do you give them an entire sentence and still maintain its shape and its structure? You can't. So what happens here in a many... Uh, we're going to change this a little bit so it's a many-to-one neural network. Because that's a little bit more like what we want. Crap. So a many-to-one, this represents the sentiment classification problem, which I'm actually going to show you momentarily in our example for today's video, because I'm actually going to show you the code this time. Where's the fill button? Come on. All right, it's really going to make this difficult for me. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Come on, just make this easy on me. There you go. Okay. Crap. All right. Come on. I probably should take and do a new take, but I'm, I've got a lot of stuff going on today. So, all right. Many to many to one. Let me write that down. Of course, it's in white. Why shouldn't it be in a color I can read? All right. Many to one. Why is it like this? Well, we're giving it multiple words. Each one of these vectors, input vectors here, represents a word. Let's say the sentence, I liked the movie. Well, each one, that would be like I, that would be liked, that would be the, and then assume we would have another one that would be the move. All right? And well, and it seems like a traditional neural network is broken up a little bit. But here's where it's special, because it's it's actually receive. Basically, the hidden layers are connected through this H of T here, which allows the I liked the movie different vectors to actually sort of communicate with each other. Is that the right word for it? Probably not. Oh no, the sun's getting really bright. Basically, what ha is over here can talk to what's over here. 
which allows the whole system to have a sort of memory, though it's very short-term, and there's a lot of problems with it, especially when you're trying to propagate errors through it, which I'll probably talk about later. Those are called long short-term memory models. That fixes it, but we don't have time for that now. Anyway, basically we have, we give it I like the movie, the, we give it the sentence, and then it does some processing on the sentence, and then it gives us one output, which will be a vector that represents the uh, sentiment. So something between, I think, 0 and 1, with 1 representing positive, 0 representing negative, or something like that. Uh, I'm just going to show you the code now. Hello, I'm back. And uh, I just opened a new um, collaboratory notebook. And I zoomed in for you guys, because this is the normal. Uh, this is the normal. So I zoomed in a little bit so you guys would see. Because I think there's some complaints in one of my older videos about not being able to see the code. <laughs> Anyways, jump right in. What is right here? Right here is the, uh, just whatever we're importing. You know, TensorFlow, Keras, and Layers, just to make my life easier. But more importantly, is this area here. Essentially, these two arguments, or variables, are going to be inputted later, as you can see right here, in order to tell the neural network how much of the data set to look at and what specific areas. Because some movie reviews will be, like, really long, you know, and we don't want to waste time on that. So it's allocated some memory for us to use. Nice. Now, uh, basically, I, right here, I just made a very simple recurrent neural network here. This is the input layer, as we saw before in our previous example. Nothing really too special about it. It doesn't have a shape or anything, because it's just taking in the words. Now, you might be saying, hey, I thought that you said there was a vector. It is a vector. That's where this kid comes in. Well, layers.embedding uh, takes the words, all 20,000 of them, and converts them to uh, 128 vector, I guess. Sounds about right. And then after that, it passes off that vector to the hidden layers. And I'm just using Kyrus's, uh simple RNN. There's more complex one, including uh, the gated recurrent unit and the long short-term memory. And I probably will talk about the long short-term memory in a later video when I go into what I'm doing for my science for project this year. Now, the TAN activation is used instead of ReLU, because this is ReLU, as um, uh, recurrent neural networks work better with more gated um, activations. Let me show you as most. So this is the function for uh, ReLU. See how it's uh, completely unbounded on the top? This is, goes on forever. It's basically a y equals x that's sort of bent but where um, tan is a little more complicated to the negative x minus e to the x. Shoot, wait, no, I got these mixed up. If there's a lot of exponentiation in this function, that's okay. I remember most of now. Shoot. e x plus e negative x. Alright, you see, tan, as you can see, is gated. It is negative 1 to... It's not negative 1, it's like negative, negative 2 point... It's negative 3, right? Negative 15, 17... Oh, wait, negative 1 to 1. I was looking at the x value for some reason, I'm an idiot. So negative 1 to 1, and this gated nature helps to prevent some uh, errors from exploding, because ReLU can have errors and either vanish, be uh, all zero, or explode, be really big, which is problematic. Okay, so that's why we're using TAN. And then basically this outputs is just, this is a many, this represents a many to one network, where we have a lot of inputs, all the words of the review, and then the thinking part, and then it all get condensed down into one class, one classification neuron, well not classification, one sentiment classification neuron, which is using sigmoid activation. And sigmoid's just being used here because it just is going to guess between 0 and 1. 0 being negative, 1 being positive, or maybe it's vice versa. And 
it's going to sort of scale the review, depending on how negative or positive it is. So a review like, uh, would be, would approach one and, uh, I would approach zero. That's basically what's going on here with the sigmoid. And then this just makes the model for Kiris, and here's our model that summary. So let's see what this happens. 2.5 2 million parameters. That's that's very big compared to the other networks. I think our um, little tiny artificial, uh, the perceptron I made in the first video all those months ago was like 1,500. So it's big. Uh, I don't know. I don't even think Google is going to let us train the whole thing. I'm running off of their uh, the free version of Google Collab. So they kind of turn off my runtime sometimes, which is annoying, but I mean, I am trying to train something with 2.5 million parameters, so I kind of deserve it. Anyway, here's just us um, importing and formatting the data set correctly. So X train, X test, and then the max features comes again to only take the top 20,000 reviews. We don't want to look at everything here. And this here just basically formats it into the max length, basically cuts off anything past 200 words. And that was pretty quick. Now, compiler, we're using Atom binary cross entropy because there's only one neuron in the end and uh, accuracy atoms are optimizer the did I talk to you guys about op optimizers or loss functions I'll do it again because I think I've learned a decent amount I'm actually maybe I should make a book review on that book I've been reading about it I'll do that when I finish in like a month okay so basically uh, starting at loss, loss really just quantifies how wrong the network is in a way that's better than accuracy, because metrics equals accuracy is just here for the humans uh, reading the uh, output. You can actually see it down here. It's showing us loss and accuracy values. And the accuracy just for the humans this represents 51% because I trained it for all of, you know, not very many. Because I, well, I was just making sure all my code ran correctly before I showed you guys. And then Adam. So yeah, so we quantified the we quantified how wrong it is, and then we give it to Adam, our optimizer, which would then uh, adjust all the weights. That's the param that's the two point five million parameters. Each parameter is a little weight is a little thing we're adding to the input in order to change it into a output, because we're adding everything together into one output, which is somewhere between zero and one. Hence the sigmoid function. Now what Adam does is it uh, tries to figure out whether changing, the make, whether subtracting a little bit from the weights or adding a little bit from the weights will um, make it better or worse, make the loss better or worse. Sounds kind of like a derivative, adding a little bit to it. Well, that's exactly what it is. Adam just needs to find the derivative of something called the gradient. The gradient being basically a function with uh, peaks and valleys that represents the um, loss or the error in our model. The higher you go on this graph, the higher the hill, the peak of the hill, the uh, worse you're doing. So Y represents the loss. We want the loss to be low. And X represents the parameter's value. So basically, you just got to figure out which direction you're going by finding the derivative of this function. And then you just go that direction until you can't really change it anymore, until you're inside of a, one of the values. That's, it's an imperfect system to some degree and has a lot of research, but it's good enough for us right now representing this. And then I'm, this is just me passing in the data, showing how much of the data to use. So batch size of equaling one, that's giving it all the data at once, which um, would probably lead to some bottlenecking. So we're gonna do less, th so the higher the number, the less less of the data you're giving at each epoch. Or is it epic? I'm gonna go with epoch, because that's what I said at first, like a year ago. And then validation data, what that is, it basically it shows it some data that it has not trained on to make sure it's not just literally um, memorizing the answer is what is called overfitting. It actually does that. If you show it a bunch of data, it'll get really, really good. It'll overfit. But then on the validation, when you actually try to test it on something in the real world, it'll not do as good. So validation data tells us whether it's actually learned. What did I just do? All right, let's run this. All right, the loss is going down, and the accuracy is going up, as we would expect. 
An ETA of 20 seconds? That's not that bad. And only two epochs? Okay, this, this, might, this might be pretty fast. Considering the amount of parameters and the activation function. Should, I guess a simple RNN with like one layer is pretty, pretty simple. There's not much going on there. Oh no. Oh no. What the? Please hold. Alright, I figured out the problem. So what happened was, is, um, I... This was called X test, and it's supposed to be called X validation for val, I guess because this is here. My bad. Now, now it runs smoothly. I also increased the batch size in order to sort of make training go by faster. It's less accurate, I'm pretty sure, because not giving it everything, but um, I don't think you guys like to watch this thing go across the screen as much as I do. So we're just going to make it a little faster, because I'm just it's just a proof of concept. I'm not trying to make an actual good model. If I was, I would be using a transformer, and we'll talk about that some other time. Hey, 97% accuracy already? It's really good. Probably way overfit, but good. Let's see how let's see how overfit it is. <laughs> oh, that is that is that is that it that I've never seen something so overfit in a very long time. So this is the score you should be looking at. This says how far we're, we've actually gotten. This is how far it thinks it's gotten. That is nearly an order of magnitude difference between those two. And this goes from 97% to 75%. So that goes from getting uh, 3 out of 100 wrong to 25 out of 100 wrong. Oh, and it, it gets worse, because as you overfit, you end up going in the wrong direction, because you're just trying to memorize at that point, and not trying to find patterns. It basically, it's it stopped finding patterns, which, not good. So, uh, how would I fix that? I would probably decrease the batch size, probably make it one epoch, train less. Ooh. Let's try that again. Take two. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I wasn't trying to make a super functional model. But I guess this allows me to demonstrate overfitting really well. Oh, it happened way faster now. This is going to be really overfit. Maybe it's because I added more e epics. Hmm. Maybe. Epoch. Alright, let's see how overfit it is. <sighs> Extremely. It's way worse than last time. Alright. I'm just going to increase this to 200... 50... Oh, well, maybe it's... Be Wait, no. Maybe it's because I right, let's add more epochs. Maybe it's because I decreased the amount of those. Probably was. Because like, that's pretty dramatic. I mean, it's around the same, but still not great. Let's try this one more time. Three epochs. Yeah, so, I think this is happening because I'm using a single, simple RNN layer. Now, recurrent neural networks, they're pretty good compared to artificial neural networks. But honestly, at some point, it just isn't worth it with just base RNN units. Because, like, this is still pretty awful in terms of overfitting. And the reason they overfit is because they ex explode. Is because any... Because the way they're set up 
when you propagate um, signal through time, it can explode or vanish, which causes your data to be all wonky. And apparently this causes severe overfitting. Okay, that is almost two orders of magnitude difference. A hundred times difference between validation loss and, val and regular loss. That's, that's enough of this. We can, we can just get rid of this. Alright, that's all for today. Bye. Thank you for watching. Uh, please let me know if you like this content and want to see more neural network type videos. And of course, like if you enjoyed. If you did not enjoy, please dislike the video and tell me what's wrong in the comments. I love to hear your feedback. Bye.